Hi, I'm David Neese with EV World News, and I'm here today with Bill Moore. We're here to talk today about electric vehicles, green energy, and the stock markets. How's it going today, Bill? Going pretty good, thank you. Well, let's get into it. We've got something interesting today, uh, and this is coming from a U.S. manufacturer for a change that's not that doesn't start with a T. And <laughs> so... It's it, it always seems like all the news on EVs is from the U.S. is basically one company or what, you know, the other companies, why they're failing. Here's one that's got something that we really hope turns into a winner. I'm a big fan of the Dodge Ram pickup trucks. And for 2025, the Ram Ram Charger is an electric truck that gets its EV juice from a gas-powered generator. So, um, you know, I immediately when I hear that, I think BMW i3. And uh, sort of, yeah. A little bit in a better way. And uh, let's see. Don't call it a plug-in hybrid or a gas-powered vehicle either. The Stellantis brand Ram wants the 2025 Ram 1500 Ram Charger to be viewed as a battery electric truck. It has a 92 kilowatt hour battery pack with 145 miles of range. That tells me it's pretty heavy because that's only, that's not even two miles per kilowatt hour. Right. Okay. And I'm going to try to start saying kilowatt hour because I've had some people complain that I uh, get my terms messed well, up. That's easy to do. I've done this 25 years and I'm still confused at times. So don't feel bad. <laughs> Um, yeah, what's interesting here, uh, the first thing that struck me, of course, was the reference to it as a, as an electric vehicle, which it's no more electric vehicle than a locomotive is. You know, all those UP trains that come through Omaha every half hour. Um, right. That's that's how they work. You've got a big, you know, diesel uh, engine in that in those. In this case, of course, it'll be a gasoline. But in the locomotive, you got a big diesel generator that, you know, spins and generates electricity and the electricity then goes to the wheels, to electric motor, and that's what propels it. And the same thing here. Now, what's interesting is that comment you made there where they say, don't call it a hybrid, right? The, the, the interesting thing is that this is exactly the same wording that came out of General Motors 20, or 12 years ago when they introduced the Volt because they, they, they did not like us referring to it as a hybrid because the competitor, of course, was the, was the Prius uh, and uh, to a lesser extent, the, the Honda Insight. But they wanted to make sure this is not a hybrid. This is an extended range electric vehicle, um, which of course by that they mean it actually the engine runs on gasoline and that turns a generator and the generator powers the electric motors and yada, yada, yada. So it's got a big enough gasoline engine or gasoline tank. It doesn't, I didn't see any numbers on that, but there's a big enough gasoline tank to take this thing almost 700 miles, which is, you know, pretty darn good. But yeah. Uh, most of that, all... of course, will be, uh, you know, operating as a hybrid. So. So my friends in the construction industry, when I, I talk to them about electric trucks, they their big thing is payload and towing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And towing, like on the F-150 Lightning, has been a big non-starter. And this has been an issue in that that 300-mile range on the F-150 goes to about 80 when you start towing. And so it's a real, you know, problem when all of a sudden you can't get stuff back and forth to a job site because when you're taking stuff out to a job site for construction you, you may be going 40 miles there and 40 miles back right. and it's it, it can be you know you don't want to be worried that you're going to run out of juice you know well, yeah, this is here and there. What, yeah for what that truck was designed as and i guess they're going to have basically three different models of of this depending on what segment of the truck market they're, they're looking at everything from kind of a, a luxury version down to sort of a standard, you know, job site version. And I think it's, you know, I, 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 you know, congratulate them for, for taking this approach. 
Um, you know, it's, it's not going to be as good as a, uh, an electric, but at the same time, uh, it's got a job to do and a mission to complete. And, you know, if, if this, I would suspect most of the driving probably around town that people will be doing will be in electric mode. Uh, the rest of the time, if they've got to haul a bobcat to a job site somewhere um, or haul their recreational trailer, you know, on vacation to Arizona, this would be the perfect the perfect solution for them. So that you know that's I don't have a problem I don't have a problem with that. Well, let's uh, see what it's got here. So it's got a 3.6 liter V6 engine with a 130 kilowatt generator, yep. and as you said, a 690 mile targeted range. Let's see. In terms of performance, it's able to go zero to sixty in four point four, which is four really fast. Four seconds, yeah. Really fast. My little Fiat. Yeah. 663 horsepower, 615 foot pounds of torque, and it had 14,000 pounds of towing capacity with a class five hitch and a max payload of 2,600 pounds. That's pretty big. They haven't shared pricing information. Customers can also plug in and charge the battery if they desire. According to the company, a 400 volt DC fast charger can add 50 miles of range in 10 minutes bi-directional charging which so they can plug right. in their tools yep. um, use it charge it at home or send power to a home campsite or tools yep. onboard power panel provides 7.2 kilowatts of power in the truck bed let's see C ram ceo tim kaniska said that it'll be a game changer for the battery electric truck they aim for 100% of sales in Europe and 50% of sales in the U.S. to be battery electric vehicles by the end of the decade. Now, basically, this is a plug-in hybrid, uh, no matter how you slice it, how the yeah. Ram charger works. Let's just kind of yeah. see what we get. The V6 engine generates mechanical power, sends it to the generator, which is mounted directly to the engine. The generator converts this to electric, can be used to charge the 92 kilowatt hour battery or be applied to the two electric drive modules. Let's see. Yeah, Folks so call a series hybrid. Between. And it shouldn't be confused with a parallel hybrid like the Prius, in which the gas engine right. directly drives the wheels. So in this one, the gas engine drives the generator, which then drives. Exactly. The, it's exactly the like the Chevrolet Volt. Mm -hmm. Same concept. Now, th that's kind of interesting. So that was from an article by TechCrunch. Now we're going to look at one here. This is a nice looking picture of the Ram. The, the Dodge has nice styling. My favorite thing actually about styling and Dodge products or Stellantis products is the control setup. I, I like the controls. In my, I've always liked Chrysler 300s and a few other vehicles as far as rental cars and Dodge mm -hmm. Ram trucks because they all have real they have the best control features and in fact I think Lamborghini has some of the same controls in some of theirs because it's done so well in the Dodge line that's the one thing they've done real well uh, the one thing is uh, of all the vehicles I've ever had where something didn't work in a rental car it was always a Chrysler product <laughs> well, you know, I, my, my, I really hate to say that. But. Yeah, my 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 big bugaboo with Chrysler products is that they just do not. If you look at, you know, Chrysler product gets about four or five years old, and it always is rusted around the wheel wells. I just don't know why they can't seem to solve that problem, but they, you know, it seems like every Chrysler, you know, every Chrysler product that I uh, drive past. Uh, that has some age on it, obviously not new ones. They have a problem where they've rusted through at the uh, now that that can that's a factor, of course, living in Nebraska and right. uh, you know salt on our roads. But you know, they, well, I wish they could come up with a way to solve that. It, it was interesting. This Forbes article, they find it surprising until now, no automaker has emulated the BMW's i3 optional range extender. A repurposed motorcycle engine yeah. gave the funky i3 a gas-powered safety net when the battery ran low, but they dropped it in favor of a bigger battery in 2019. Yeah. But it's back in the RAM. Let's see. 
I'm not so sure this article really adds much to the other discussion, but big heavy trucks need lots of energy and towing is the most energy intense use of any vehicle. No. Battery EVs are at their most efficient on city streets. Let's see. They see if it really gives more information on towing. Um, they do mention that it's got BMW M3 like acceleration. It's <laughs> I'm yeah, really kind of curious. Are have fun. You know, they like to talk about the horsepower and all that, and then it can tow 14,000 pounds, but nobody really wants to talk about what kind of range there yeah, you're gonna is. Get with, well, that, that'll depend obviously on what you're hauling, you know. So you're hauling an Airstream, it'll be different from hauling a, uh, you know, a Bobcat or a Ditch Witch or something on the back. Now, here's something interesting. When the vehicle only has 145 miles of range remaining, that's when the generator kicks in. Otherwise, you stay in electric mode. Yeah. And in Chevrolet and, Volt's case, it was like 40 miles. So that's a, they've upped that considerably. Um, but then again, it's a large, obviously it's a 92 you know, kilowatt hour battery pack. So uh, that's going to cost you. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see. I bet this thing comes in. It's going to easily come in around 70 or 70 or 80,000 would be my yeah. guess. Now, there, there's one of their luxury models, the Limited and Tungsten Cabins. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, I was hoping we'd get a little bit of information on their solution, but I, I'm expecting that with the addition of, you know, the gas power plant that they've got some way to work around that issue. But, you know, if it's got a 700 mile range and even if it cut it down to 200 miles towing, that's still a lot better than the F-150. Oh, yeah. You know, so that's a... Uh, well, the yeah, they're they're you know we're we're still very early in the learning stage here. You know, when you think about it, we're right now where the automotive industry would have been around 1920. Because right. it's been about it's been about 20 years, um, you know, since we started getting into this game seriously, and you know, look where the automotive industry was in 1920. You know, Henry Ford was still rolling out, you know, Model T's and the Model uh, Model A wouldn't come up for another, what, I think six years? Right. Right. And, and I've looked through a couple of the other articles even to see if there is anything covering. They, they don't give any details about my concern about towing and working with it around a job site. But here was one that was uh, kind of interesting. The seven coolest features of the Ram 1500 EV that's coming up. And, you know, a V6 with no connection to the wheels, multiple charging solutions, mm -hmm. co-pilot digital display, ultra luxury front seats, Klipsch sound system, no need for a key, and hands-free driving. Now, this is kind of a big thing, especially for somebody that's a contractor. They've got people calling them all the time, people uh, texting them all the time, and they're very, they can be very distracted. And so things that help a distracted driver, I think are really going to be yeah. top features. Yeah, yeah. can I make a suggestion? Yes. The automotive industry, as you move more into this automated autopilot kind of driving, I would like to see the federal government require that there is a light of some type, an indication that this car is in auto drive mode. And my suggestion a long time ago was that in the back of the car, there's a light above the above the rear window. Or the rear window that possibly is blue or green or some some color other than red or white that indicates that this car is in auto drive mode. Because it because of we're finding that the people that are most concerned about this whole shift to you know the the uh, uh, 
robo taxis and things like that is the fact that they just don't trust at this point they just don't trust the cars uh to be you know to be driving themselves so as i personally as a driver i would like to know whether or not there's a person at the wheel that's actually controlling that vehicle or whether it's software uh if i'm going to pass them or get behind them or you know whatever well uh, then I'm you not- know what to expect from that vehicle too what's that well, then you know what to expect from that vehicle. Yes, too. If you're passing exactly. somebody, you know that you're going to go to pass them. They're not going to accelerate and be a jerk and speed up while you're trying to pass yeah. them. Or, so, you know. Yeah. So if like the uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Board is listening, <laughs> uh, please give thought to some kind of a rule that requires, as we get more into this whole autopilot, autonomous driving that you require the car makers to indicate when that car is in that mode so that all the drivers around them know that that's what's happening. I think that'll do a lot to boost the confidence. I think it will as well. And let's talk about one other topic today. So Toyota is up in arms about Tesla's giga casting. And this is kind of interesting because Tesla is talking about how they're going to make cars cheaper by instead of having, I don't know, it was like 40 different parts underneath by making it one. Right. And, you know, Toyota is not happy about this. Challenge lies in on the production line where Tesla's groundbreaking giga casting methodology is redefining the rules of the game. Toyota is making significant progress in solid state battery tech and heavily investing in the US EV market. Yet it finds itself in a challenging position due to Tesla's innovative assembly process termed giga casting. What's interesting is, you know, we hear all these articles about how Toyota isn't interested in EVs. They're avoiding EVs. EVs aren't the future. Everything's going to be hydrogen. It's going to be all this. But Tesla's, but Toyota's putting as the world's largest car maker, they're putting a lot of a lot into EV. They're doing a lot of yeah, studies eight, on solid eight, state eight billion, batteries. Yeah, eight billion for a uh, battery plant here in the United States. So, oh wow, yeah. yeah, yeah. So they're really doing something, and it's very interesting that it would take somebody like Tesla, who isn't the car industry veteran decided that they're going to do things a different way. Well, just, just so, you know, I I don't know if probably people listening to this already kind of have a sense for what gig casting is, but basically what, what that is, is they are looking to create at this point, it's the rear assembly of the car. And now they're beginning to take a look at the front assembly of the car as all one unit, rather than multiple parts that are brought together and then go through this phalanx of robots that you know weld all that together. Uh, they, you know, taking what probably several minutes at least um, to instead just go into a press. You know, pour molten aluminum in there, press it. You know, to uh, to once to to the casting size, pull it out, and that process. I think I remember it takes less than a minute. So they could just you know eliminate all that extra labor and parts and materials down to a process that just takes a minute. Put it in there, press it, pull it out, let it get cooled off, send it on down the line, and then start mating the you know the wheels to it and the and uh, you know battery controllers for the front end and all the things that have to happen later. But that first part is done in a minute's time which would just revolutionize, not only, you know, revolutionize the the process in terms of the speed of turning these cars down, but really cut the cost of the car. That's why, you know, I think Tesla's probably saying, you know, we, we can probably build a $25,000 uh, electric car, which Elon says is probably going to take place in Berlin. So where, right. by the way, they just gave, they just gave the workers raises. <laughs> nice. Nice. Um, yeah, I, I saw that. We, we talked about that a little bit on the show yesterday about the, it looks like the Model 2 is going to enter production in Germany first. Yeah. They're talking about a 25,000 euro price point. And, you know, 
I'll leave it to Tesla to come up with something. Hoping it, hopefully it'll be nice looking. Hopefully. Yeah, there's all kinds of sketches out there of people conceptualizing, you know, what it'll look like a hatchback and, you know, I, th I think some of the, some of these guys, we, you know, are out. Some of the designers, freelance designers, are out there hoping that it'll, you know, it'll maybe inspire them to get uh, hired by Tesla to work on it. So we'll see. Oh, that'd be nice. But I, I think that's a good way to look at things. You know, the way Toyota builds cars has been considered the standard, but it's like shocking to think of what Tesla is proposing is likely to become the standard for producing EVs. Now, I'm wondering, is giga casting not practical on internal combustion cars? Maybe, oh, sure. Maybe that's the... it, can be, it can be applied to any any automotive system. The question, One of the questions which I think is interesting is that how do you uh, how do you repair once you get into a rear end collision, how, you know, when you've got the single cast unit, how do you repair that? And uh, that's, I think, is still an open question. It's obviously stronger uh, because it's one unit, but then again, are body shops prepared to take and, you know, what do they do? They have to, you know, uh, order a whole new casting replacement. Or can they just do like they do in a body shop and cut that piece out and weld in a new piece and go from there? I don't, I don't know. And I don't know if they have an answer yet. I haven't seen anybody seriously discussing it at this point. So here's something kind of interesting. This interesting statement that's not about the Giga Castaway. Toyota aims to sell 3.5 million battery vehicles annually starting in 2030, but only 123,000 this year. So we're talking... Six years from now, they're planning on going from 123,000 EVs to 3.5 million EVs. Because, I, I, you know, I, I, they already sell that many. I guess they already right. sell that many cars worldwide as it is. But, it, you know, they're planning on them all changing. So all this talk about Toyota is not doing this or Toyota is not doing that is a little bit uh, unfounded. Well, they, yeah, they, they, you know, they backtracked on that. We're not going to, you know, go the high to go, go, excuse me. We're not going to go the electric car route, you know, a couple of years ago where they rolled out, what was it? Seven or eight prototype EV model, pure EV models. So, so yeah, they're, they're, they're working on it, but you know, their bread and butter uh, has been obviously gasoline. And I think, what did they do? They did the 10 millionth hybrid here, maybe a month or two ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, that's been the bread and buddy of the company. And, uh, you know, I drive one, um, my neighbor up the street drives one, you know, you can't go. It used to be that seeing a hybrid was like seeing a Prius in Omaha. Right. right. And now you see, you know, you see them everywhere. So it's, that's done them well. And you can see why they're a little reluctant. Of course, they still haven't gotten their mind settled on, do we go with hydrogen? Do we go with hybrid? Do we go with all battery electric? Occasionally, you'll see these stories that you know I think are clickbait about they've revolutionized this new engine and this ammonia engine is going to do away with electrics. You know what? Well, you know, so, yeah. so have have they really decided on the direction they're going to go? It's probably still a little up in the air. Well, their last true EV in the U.S. was what the Busy Forks. I'm sorry. Um, the Busy Forks um bz 4x or something like that oh yeah yeah, yeah. people call it the busy forks <laughs> okay <laughs> that was a terrible name absolutely terrible i mean the, like, you know, the Myra, the, you know okay i can see that but what be what, what? so yeah, yeah busy forks um one of the complaints about evs is supposedly all the good names have been taken and nobody knows what to name them so uh <laughs> You know, <laughs> well, you just is, do like BMW, you just throw an X and an, you know, an I in front I, of you, you're I, good to go. Yeah, right, right. It, it is it is kind of humorous how a lot of that has, you know, played out. It's like, well, we don't know what to name. Well, Mercedes and BMW figured it out a long time ago. They stopped giving the cars names. Yeah. It was Americans that give figured them, every car needed a yeah. name. And we, can, we only have so many American Indian tribes we can... Uh, <laughs> name thing or, or uh you know i i don't know 
and and now it's now it's not socially acceptable to name anything after Indian tribes. Yeah, you so, know, can you can you see a a, a Toyota Blackfoot? You know, right? <laughs> yeah, or, or Toyota Nez Perce, or they have a Cheyenne. You know, Chevrolet Cheyenne. So they've done that. In uh, college, I played for the Fighting Sioux. Now they're the Fighting Hawks. Yeah, and uh, you know. Um, Morningside University used to be the Chiefs, and forget what they are now. Uh, the, something, it's something worse. I, I remember when they were talking about renaming the Washington Redskins. Yeah, the the big thing going around I like to always say was that the word Washington was offensive, you know, and they should drop Washington. They keep the Redskins part. Yeah, they're 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 what now? The Generals or what are they? For Nationals, right? Washington I Nationals, I think they are. Yeah, <laughs> that's terrible. I, I don't watch. I, I don't watch. I have friends in the NFL, and I don't watch. Um, but uh, you know, that's uh, you know, that's, that's the world we live in now. Anyways, well, okay, good show folks. today. We There's actually plenty kind more of a long stories show. on evworld.com. Hundred and eight that I added just this morning. So have fun. <laughs> Nice. All right, Bill. 